So we were discussing bone formation. We talked about bone as a tissue. The long bone is our candidate example bone. We looked at the, uh, the uh, parts of it, the surface areas, the, uh, the divisions of a long bone. That's our candidate bone, the way to understand bone as a tissue. Uh, we had just looked at intramembranous ossification at the end of last class, the way that flat bones are formed. And flat bones have hard, compact bone layers on the, uh, the superficial surfaces, and then a sandwich of spongy bone in the middle. And so it's a pretty durable, lightweight, flat sheet of bone. Now we're going to look at endochondral ossification, which follows a very similar formula, but this results in the production of long bones, cylindrical long bones. Most other bones will be formed by this process, but uh, it's easier to understand in long bones because there are two sites of growth. It's got one simple shape. They all start in the same way. When the fetus develops, there's a, cartil uh, a cartilaginous model that's formed. So it's essentially a bone made of cartilage. The humerus is made of cartilage. The femur is made of cartilage. There is a model that is somehow formed according to a program in development. And at this point, it's not a bone. This is just a template for a bone to be produced. That model will grow as the embryo grows. It will lengthen. It will become more of a cylinder. It will start to get the uh, irregularity, the, the shape that distinguishes it from other bones. The model starts to grow. In this case, we're thinking of the humerus, of so the upper arm bone. It elongates, and it's generally a, a pretty, pretty easy uh, cylinder, easy to interpret. Now, as it grows, the cartilage proliferates, but it's still not a bone. Something has to happen for it to become a bone. That catalyst is the main arterial supply, a nutrient artery, piercing that model right in the middle. And you can see a nutrient artery starting to pierce the bone in the middle. The cartilage is growing. There are chondrocytes that are starting to release um, the extracellular matrix. And the uh, nutrient artery allows osteocytes, osteoblasts, and progenitor cells to arrive. Those are the, the cells that will build bone eventually. And so it penetrates right in the middle and starts to spread outwards. As those branches spread outwards, we start to see bone tissue produce, and that bone tissue spreads outwards as well. And as the bone tissue spreads outwards, we hollow out the inside of the bone. So at this point... The model is starting to ossify along the diaphysis, that central column of the long bone. It's enlarging or it's spreading top to bottom, and then the cavity is widening as the nutrient artery sends uh, offshoots to all the tissue surrounding. So the tissue starts to, uh, to grow and enlarge, cavity grows and enlarges, and bone is formed around the periphery. Now, in general, that process describes how the long bone, the, the diaphysis, the middle portion of the long bone, will be formed. But it doesn't talk about the ends, the top and bottom of the long bone, the epiphyses, the book ends, are formed by a similar process but not because the nutrient artery sends branches to those regions. They have their own arteries that pierce the collagen model, deliver osteocytes and progenitor cells that allow bone to grow. And those are epiphyseal arteries. Well, that makes sense. Epiphyseal arteries pierce the epiphyses, or the cartilage that will become the epiphyses, and the same procedure happens. The cartilage starts to calcify, 
the bone tissue spreads and grows outwards as the epiphyseal arteries send uh, branches to the, uh, the book ends, the top of the long bone. And so you have these two main centers, ossification centers, where bone is proliferating and growing. One in the diaphysis, one in each epiphysis, and they're converging. There's bone in each of those centers, and there's still cartilage between the two. And you can see that that sandwiched line between the two is called the epiphyseal plate. <coughs> Think of it as if you were serving the epiphysis for dinner on a plate. The epiphyseal plate. It's the border between those two areas where the uh, ossification centers meet. And this, as you grow and develop, is cartilage. It doesn't fuse into bone until you are a fully mature and grown adult, 20 years old, 18 to 20 years old. When your bones have stopped growing, that's where the epiphyseal line, or sorry, the epiphyseal plate fuses to become the epiphyseal line. So that's probably right around where most of you are right now, right? Probably still have a little bit of bone growth happening, but the epiphyseal plate is starting to slow down. Your bones aren't growing as much anymore, and eventually they'll fuse, and you will be at a fixed height, the, the tallest height that you will ever be, and you'll gradually shrink over the decades until you're 70 or 80. You can see that process in, um, what is this? It's an electron micrograph, but this is a 12-week-old fetus. You can see the, the dark staining areas of the bones that are calcified, the lighter staining areas where uh, the calcified matrix hasn't been laid out. Those are still cartilage. And you can imagine this dark staining area spreading outwards to eventually encompass the entire model. Like I said, this is a stepwise overview, and you will get... Um, more of a, a detailed approach in lab. So, bones are formed by this process. Long bones are formed by this process. But there's a far cry from a bone that's formed and is this large in a fetus to the bones that you have right now to the bones that you'll develop and uh, have as an adult, fully formed adult long bones. How? Do these bones, when they're formed, continue to grow? The diaphysis is fixed. The epiphysis is fixed. Those are bony tissues, but they grow outward. So we're going to look at elongation and then growth in circumference uh, on the next couple slides. The humerus is short when you're young, and it grows as you age. How does it grow in length? It still grows according to the blueprint of endochondral ossification. It's still called endochondral ossification. Specifically, when we talk about the growth in length or elongation, it's interstitial growth. And the really important area to focus in on for bone elongation is in the metaphysis, right? That's the area between the epiphysis on the end and the diaphysis in the middle. Meta, between. And even more specifically, the epiphyseal plate that I mentioned before. You can kind of see that curved line shown here behind these bands of color. That is the line that grows and elongates and makes new bone. That allows long bones to grow in length. So we're going to focus in on that line. And in general, these highlighted areas are going to correspond to different phases of the cartilage that we'll look at on the right-hand side. So bone tissue on the left, cartilage is on the right, zoomed in with an electron microscope. And uh, we'll talk about those in a little bit of detail. 
But first, I want to orient you to how these are set up. We are looking at the humerus on the left. So the most superficial, the top, is up. We're looking at the femur on the right. So this is the inferior surface. These are actually flipped. It's a little bit confusing. But if we look top to bottom at the layers on the left-hand side, they match in the opposite order on the right-hand side. I'll show you what I mean. So the most superficial or superior layer is the zone of resting cartilage. And you can see that mirrored in the electron picture. It's all the way at the bottom. It's on the top, on the left, at the bottom, on the right. So it's mirrored and reversed. The zone of resting cartilage is closest to the end of the bone. Think of it that way. The zone of resting cartilage all you need to know is the name. This is cartilage that's not doing anything. It's at rest. And technically, this isn't even part of the growth plate. This is just the place where cartilage is taken from. This is what fuels the growth plate. The zone of resting cartilage. And you can see a bunch of small chondrocytes in their lacunae sitting quietly with lots of ground substance around them. Boring. They're sitting there at rest. Now something will prompt these to, uh, to grow and proliferate. When they are triggered by whatever the developmental program is, they are pushed into, they're drawn into, the zone of proliferating cartilage. Okay, well first, the cartilage is resting and not doing anything. Then it proliferates. What does that mean? It simply means that the cells increase in number. The chondrocytes become more plentiful. And this area is really easy to pick out. You see these long streaks? It looks like it's a stack of coins. Long streaks, columns of coins. As you can imagine, the chondrocytes starting to bubble up. So the chondrocytes start to grow and proliferate. Let me correct that. They start to proliferate. The next area is where they start to grow. The zone of hypertrophic cartilage. Again, the name tells you what's going on here. Hypertrophy. You might have heard of that anecdotally. If you've ever... Uh, read popular online muscle building blogs or whatever, hypertrophy, the growth in size of a tissue. You can see those stacked coins are not so linear and, and striped. They're not striated. Now every cell is starting to bubble and enlarge. They're crowding out the other tissue, the connective tissue in the, in the cartilage. So chondrocytes are growing in size now that they are more numerous. And then as they burst and rupture, they calcify. The zone of calcified cartilage is where these cells get too large, they calcify and burst, and at that point they become new bone. So resting chondrocytes start to become more numerous, they grow in number, then they grow in size, and when they get too big, they burst and calcify, forming new bone. So what does this say for how long bones grow in length? We add new bone in this gray region. And those cells come from this pink region. New bone is added to the gray region and it pushes the rest of these layers up. So the diaphysis grows in length, whereas the epiphyses on the end, they just move up as the central column grows. The diaphysis grows in length. That's where we're adding new bone tissue. And then the line 
simply bubbles to the surface. It pushes the entire top of the bone up. The epiphysis doesn't really change in size or shape, but the diaphysis elongates. This will continue until you turn 18 or 21 years old, at which point you won't have the proliferation and growth of chondrocytes. They will fuse in a calcified matrix and become a noteworthy line. You'll see that in lab. This is only growth in length. At the same time, we need to grow in diameter. Imagine only growing in length. Really long, thin bones. Wouldn't do well for track and field, basketball, any type of sports. So growing in circumference is also quite important circumferential growth. So what I've done here, or what this image has done, is it's taken the humerus that we've been looking at in, uh, in a frontal plane, it's sliced the top off, and it's turned it towards you, and now we're looking at a transverse or a cross section. So this is the edge of the humerus. If my arm was the humerus looking at you, and I slice the top off here, I'm looking at the edge. Periosteum around the outside. Periosteal arteries. Remember, those are the arteries that line the outside of the long bone. As the bone grows in diameter, we don't just push those arteries out. We lay down new layers of bone and envelop the periosteal arteries. So you can imagine these almost staying still, and the bone grows around them. It merges where it meets around the outside of the periosteal artery. It creates a canal, creates a hole. What we're witnessing here is the start of the formation of a new osteon. This hole in the center will become the central canal, or the uh, perversion canal. So bone grows around, encloses the periosteal artery. The periosteum on the outside folds up onto itself. Now that it's sealed inside, it's not around the outside of the bone. It's internal. So we call it something different. This is now endosteum. We have a new sealed canal that must grow inwards as the bone continues to expand. So we seal up the canal slightly. Osteoblasts start to, bring, uh, to build concentric rings, like the rings of a tree, inwards towards those arteries. while at the same time, osteoblasts around the outside lay down those circumferential rings, allowing the bone to grow outwards in diameter. So concentric rings in, circumferential around the outside diameter of the bone. And this process continues. You can see in this example, another periosteal artery is about to be enveloped. This is another osteon that will be formed, and the same process will occur. Through these repeated steps, the bones get thicker. Now, if we left everything like this, we would have very dense, strong bones. Dense means heavy. And that's not advantageous for quickly jumping out of the way of a saber-toothed tiger or for charging down an antelope, hunting your dinner. It's not advantageous to be weighed down by heavy bones. And so throughout the entire process where we grow in length, you can see where interstitial growth would occur. If the ice cream cone slices over on the left-hand side, we're growing in length. Where we just saw the bones grow in diameter, 
we were focused in on this small area only. As those processes are occurring, the bone as a whole is also, uh, or sorry, the, the medullary cavity is widening. Osteoclasts inside the bone are making um, that space inside larger so that any old bone that had been deposited inside is eaten away. This maintains an appropriate, let's call it strength to weight ratio. The bones are rigid, they're strong, they can be somewhat flexible, but they're not overly heavy because we are widening this internal chamber to allow or to get rid of any unnecessary bone tissue. And this process, as we've applied it to a long bone, will happen to a cuboidal bone or an irregularly shaped vertebra. It's just not as easy to figure out where the epiphyseal plate is, what part is growing. But this is our candidate for how we understand the process. Now let's start to put these together. I already mentioned the organiza uh, organization of the skeletal system last class. There should be, in every one of you, 206 bones. We've counted again and again. We know how many there should be. And we divide these into two main regions. The axial skeleton, which is everything on the axis or on the midline. It includes the thoracic cage, the skull, all the vertebrae, the sacrum, which is part of the pelvis. We've also included, there are small bones in the inner ear that we're not going to look at in detail yet, but those are within that midline portion. And this interesting word, the hyoid bone, is the bone a very small bone that's held in your focal cord by your trachea. It's actually only connected to cartilage, not connected to other bones. There is one hyoid bone, uh, bone in your throat, and that's on the axis. We include that as part of the axial system as well. But for our purposes, we are really going to focus on the skull, the vertebrae, the thoracic cage, and the ribs. That vertical axis, the inner ear bone, bones of the hyoid bone, we will um, not come back to those very often. 80 bones, you can add them up if you want to. Everything else is part of the appendicular system. Kind of like the central versus peripheral nervous system. Central was the brain and spinal cord, peripheral was everything else. Well, the axial is everything on that main axis. And if you remember those, the appendicular skeleton is everything else. The bones of the upper limb, the shoulder girdle, the rest of the pelvis, both legs, all the hand bones, finger bones, toe bones, 126 more bones. And it's not our purpose right now to look at those. We will investigate as we move through the body looking at bones, joints, muscles, what those bones are. Right now, I just want you to know the gross division between those two. And so in general, bone tissue, let's summarize quickly. I saw a lot of uh, heads held in hands, always talking about diaphyses, epiphyses, metaphyses, articular cartilage. Once you get to know those, at least, they don't change. Diaphysis is in the middle. That's the column of a long bone, and it's bookended on either side by metaphyses, epiphyses, and articular cartilage. And I was trying to find a way that I could help you remember this. So I, I was writing down the divisions as they would appear. And this is really cheesy. 
but I'm old now and I'm allowed to be cheesy and this is going to stick with you, but imagine if Cardi B went to med school. Right? Cardi MD. You're never going to forget it. Cartilage, epiphysis, metaphysis, diaphysis, and then it's mirrored on the other side. Those were in long bones. They're easy to distinguish. Long bones and flat bones were the regular type of bones that we saw. Those are, are what we'll come back to when we talk about uh, bone formation, for instance. But we also have irregularly shaped bones that serve special purposes. And we will allude to those when we get to that section um, when we talk about the bones and muscles specifically. In general, all bone tissue whether it's flat, whether they are irregular, whether it's a long bone, has a hard outer compact bone surface that covers a layer of spongy bone with an opening or cavity in the middle. And depending on how big the bone is, will dictate how big the cavity is. There's a larger cavity in long bones than there are in flat bones. There's not even a cavity in flat bones. But that opening is where the uh, marrow sits where we produce red blood cells, where some fat is stored, and we'll come back to that later. It's not necessarily important now, just know that there is a cavity inside. We spent a long time talking about the processes by which bone forms. They both follow a similar program, intramembranous. Imagine one membrane, which would be a sheet ossifying. <laughs> Intramembranous forms flat bones. Endochondral forms long bones. In both cases, it's a template that is gradually calcified and solidified as the uh, nutrient arteries branch and grow outwards. For growth in length and growth in width, we're really focused on, excuse me, the epiphyseal plate for growth in length, and then the outer circumference of the bone for growth in width, or, or growth in circumference. Eventually, those stop as you reach maturity and your bones fully develop, but it's an important process to understand. And lastly, fully developed adult bones separated into two main categories. This is probably one of the easiest take-homes to take from this section. Axial versus appendicular skeleton. <coughs> Excuse me. Off some pages. Any questions about this? Put them to death. So I think I want to do, let me just check the, the other notes. I know, I know, grumble, grumble, grumble. <laughs>